Welcome back, everybody, to the Growing Band Director podcast. This is episode number 67 with Dick Dunscombe, and Jeff's here with me as well. Um, Dick, you said something in um, a, a podcast with um, Dr. Tim a few years ago that really struck me, so I wrote it down. It said, the entire history of jazz is on YouTube. And we know that learning about jazz, so much of it is history, but so much of it is specific things as well. And I, I just want to thank you for that comment because, I mean, I, I knew that, but to have it said in such a way, it's like you have no reason not to be able to listen back and listen to the orange, origins of this music. Um, so I can't wait for what you're going you're gonna to share with us. For people who don't know Dick, I mean, I think you, have, you are um, one of the icons in our jazz education field. Just to mention a few things, Dr. Tim called you the Dean of Jazz Education World. Um, we're part of the start of IAG and now Jen in the Hall of Fame and Vice President of the Midwest Clinic. Um, so thank you again for all your service and I can't wait to hear from you. Um, can we first start talking about, say the average band director, like you've heard how many thousands of band direct bands in your, in your teaching time, um, many of them. So what is some like, what is some of your most common advice that would you go to work with a band? But what are, what are things that you work on the most? Well, first of all, let me thank you, Kyle and Jeff, for allowing me to share the screen with you tonight. I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to be here, and I will do my very best to share with you um, the ideas that I've gained over some 40, 50 years of teaching. Uh, I have three things that I would share with the beginning band director that they really need to, to be aware of. One is the listening aspect. If, if you don't know what it sounds like or your students don't know what it sounds like, then it's not gonna happen. The second thing is articulation. And articulation in a jazz field is one of the only few different things that we have between concert and orchestra uh, that makes jazz uh, unique in its own, own way. Uh, the third thing, of course, is rhythm section, because this is not present in other organizations. And so we, uh, we really need to understand the rhythm section to make the jazz band complete and to allow it to swing. And then uh, 3A would be improvisation. So I think those are the main things that I would talk to the beginning band director or as actually any band director about uh, to improve uh, the quality of the product. Um, that's great. That's so awesome. So let's start. Can we start with articulation? To me, um, and I'm glad you said all those things. I feel like we're, I'm, on a, I'm on a similar page with you. Um, I feel like when I listen to a band, if the rhythm section isn't too loud, <laughs> which it, it frequently is, <laughs> um, especially the, the uh, amplified rhythm section. Um, and then, but if, and if you hear that the notes and rhythms are all correct, but the band just isn't, you know, as good as you want it to be, to me, that articulation is really the big piece because I don't know, I, when I frequently get to clinic bands, I don't usually hear bands with a lot of wrong notes and rhythms. It's usually just it doesn't swing or pop the way it's supposed to. So mm -hmm. can we can we dig into the articulation thing a little bit? Um, in in articulation, we have the syllables that begin with the do tongue instead of the ta, which we're taught as a beginning um, as a beginning uh, student, and that's appropriate for a concert band and in a lot of actions with the, uh, with the, the orchestral uh, world as, as well. But in jazz, uh, it's, a, it's too abrupt. And some of the things that happen in jazz are very smooth and then with an abrupt ending. So I have four or five different articulations that I use. One is do, which is just simply D U and that's for a long note mm -hmm. and da, which is a connector note. So do, da, do, da, do, da, do. And then the short note at the end of the phrase would be dot. So do, da, do, da, dot, 
do da do da dot. And then the heavily accented note, which is the D-A-H-T dot, that's an accent that we're uh, very familiar with in jazz. The dot, the D-A-H-T, is that what you're referring to as the, the accent, the hat accent? Yes. Okay, yes. so that's, that's fatter than... than um, do that's you, do that's you... the fat accent, and it's also what would be the uh, cap or mm -hmm. uh, accent in, in that manner in, in most of the, the things that we see. So what I was going to say as you, as you pull that up is that um, what that does too, um, you notice as, as Dick was singing some of those rhythms, any note in jazz that's followed by a rest needs to get a tongue. Because you hear a lot of jazz bands that go with four eighth notes and they slur them together and they don't tongue the last note. That's a huge thing in my understanding that the when once you tongue the note before a rest, that automatically is like a, a no brainer. Yeah, generally speaking, that's a, a that is appropriate. Uh, let's go to the the articulations. Here is the one that I wanted to share with you the okay. the D tongue, and this this example shows each one of the um, the articulations. And, and these are just suggestions. I mean, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be these, but there does need to be a, a list of articulations that the, the director and the students will know. For example, in this next slide, this is Duke's place. Do dot, do dot, do dot, do dot. Do that, do that, do that, do that. Very simple, but but it begins to to talk about the articulations, mm -hmm. and then when you get into a little bit more more uh, advanced line, here's uh, jazz line, and although the articulations are not all written in, they're implied. Do do dot, do do dot, do do da da, do do dot dot. Do do da da do do da 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 do do da da do 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 da do do da. So hopefully that gives you an idea of how the application of those articulations makes it feel more like jazz, and particularly in the swing style. Can you leave that slide up just for a second? As I see that, I hear a lot of bands who would play da 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 da. Right. So oh, yeah. you'll notice as Dick sung it, not only did you use the syllables, but you connected all of the running eighth notes. There was no space in between those eighth notes. Um, that's a really huge one. It is. And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, the, uh, the identification between uh, the way the articulations are done outside of jazz and inside of jazz are quite different. And you've described it perfectly. Great. So, you know, I think I think articulation is such a big, uh, uh, such a big sort of task for all of us. Um, you know, I would urge people to go into their scores and um, figure out what you want to use for articulation. Write them in your scores. Take the time to have your students with their pencils change articulations, write articulations. Because I think I think judge publishers are great, but there's so many there's so many charts that have publications. You know, the way they write the articulations are not really super accurate. So it, it really is on the director to make sure that you understand what it's supposed to be. And if you don't know what articulation to use, listen to the recording even more and use what's on there or ask a buddy, ask a, uh, a jazz, a jazz buddy. If you're new to it. When I was teaching high school at the beginning of my career, I had a really good jazz band, Champaign Central High School in Illinois. And we did a lot of singing and I think singing is important because that uh, articulation then applies when you put the instrument up to your mouth. So, you know, they were, they were so adept at that, that when we were on our way to one of the festivals, they actually sang the whole program mm -hmm. in the bus. And I was astounded. I didn't realize what an impact that was having on the way that they were able to play jazz. Great. And yet, I, I really agree with you. I think that one of the things that I used to do when I was teaching high school was that 
we would every before we would sight read a piece, we'd sing it. Mm -hmm. It just keep going over what the proper syllables were and sing it. And a lot of times when we were on our way to a festival, my kids would get in the back of the bus, they get bored, and I said, "Well, why don't you sing a show?" And then they just sing the whole thing, and then they'd sing another tune and another tune, and I'd say, "Okay." Had enough of the singing for now. Let's relax for a little while. But when we go into that sight reading part of the IAJ, IAJE festivals, we'd go in and, you know, they said you can't play. So mm -hmm. they had five minutes when you can talk through the piece. And I said, just sing it. And then it was time to play it. It was no problem because they mm -hmm. just sang the whole. It's critical. It's absolutely critical. Yeah. And there's a, there's a method that was used and still is used today. Um, by many bands that, from my knowledge, was started by the great jazz educator Steve Massey in Foxborough. Um, called he calls it the rhythm train method, the sing and dance method. And what it basically is is you take the you know you take the syncopation for the modern drummer, the Ted Reed syncopation book, and you basically put on you know you need to put on a, a track of of any kind of music or have your drummer play time, and the kids move to the music. They pat the backbeat. Mm -hmm. Um, they're singing all the time. You can sing and then play and then sing and then play and just doing it every day. And I got to say, I've done it every day since October 7th when I met with Aaron Bush. Um, and I learned about that and my band, the, the groove has been 10 times better in the last, what is that? Six months, six months from now, mm -hmm. just by, just by doing that method. So you're right. The singing part is huge. And I find that when my kids do it every day with each other and they're moving to the music that that internalizes so much of what is needed. I totally agree. Great. Um, anything else you want to hit here, Dick, before we get into rhythm section? Well, uh, just, just the fact that this sets up the, the wins in terms of being jazzy. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, it's, it's appropriate now to turn to the rhythm sections. It's so big. I have a, a mentor named Tom Lazat who once who once um, told somebody else who was not a a jazz teacher or a jazz player. He said, "Look, jazz ensemble is just wind symphony with a rhythm section. It's just another set of instruments that that you need to get your handle on." So, my big advice before we get started would be to everybody for everybody to pick a, a rhythm section instrument they don't know how to play and learn how to play it. Yeah, and I think it's important for the director to sit down at the drum set mm -hmm. and begin to understand what the student is doing. But as I show you here in the screen sharing, uh, rhythm is fundamental to creating the feeling for any genre of music. It is therefore vital that the jazz rhythm section must create the appropriate rhythm feel and style of swing. So what we're talking about is the bass, the piano, the guitar, and the drums. Mm -hmm. Now, the heartbeat of the band is the bass and the drums. And the model for all of this in a swing style, of course, is Count Basie. Sure. And listen to the bass and drums in the Basie band as they complement each other. The bass plays the steady quarter notes, and the drums reinforce that with a triplet-based uh, swing style on the ride cymbal and hi-hats. So... So I, th I think it's really important to talk about that bass and drum connection. So yes. um, you, you know, you like many, many other people put the bass right on the ride cymbal. And what's it's really convenient, I found as a teacher, is that the right hand of the drummer is what is keeping that quarter note time or triplet bass quarter note time. And it's the right hand of the bass player. So literally, their, their right hands have to be really in sync to make that groove deep. Yes, and, and not only do they need to be close together, as they're shown in this diagram, but they need to watch each other. And, and you're absolutely right in what each one of those people should be watching, and that is their right hands and to create a groove, because a groove is what makes the rhythm section propel the rest of the ensemble. Mm -hmm. You'll also notice that the guitar and piano player are very close together. And, and let me also tell you at this point about amplifiers. Um, the amplifier behind the bass and behind the guitar should be about two or three feet behind so that the player can hear 
what the sound is that the audience hears. So many uh, groups I go in and work with, you know, they're sitting on top of the amp or the amp is in front of them and they have no idea what their sound is. So in this, in this situation, they do. And so that's the appropriate way of setting it up. You'll also notice that the bass amp is behind the drummer. So the drummer can hear the bass amp because some, sometimes we get the bass player and, and the amp is not is in front of the drummer and that's a problem. I was also taught that the amps traditionally, the sound comes out like an ice cream cone. So the student needs to be within that ice cream cone within two to three feet, not closer. Exactly right. And, and the amp also, uh, I found for the bass player, in many instances, is best situated set it on, setting on a chair as opposed mm -hmm. to on the floor and mm -hmm. turned a little bit toward the ensemble so they can hear it as well. Jeff, can you come in with your double bass thing that we talked about a couple times? Yeah. I want people to well, hear it already. Well, I did with my younger and intermediate groups. I'd have the amp for the bass right where you have it, but then I'd have another amp pigtailed to that amp on the other side of the band, angled into the band, so everybody in the band could feel the bass part going on all the time as a learning technique to get them to feel what the bass sounds like all the time. I think that's a great idea, and I think also I would put in that amp the hi-hat. Yeah, that's a cool idea. Yep, good idea. And the um, how do you feel about double comps? Where I come from teaching... We used to have a lot of adjudicators coming in from New York City, and they would always at clinics be, don't do a double comp between your piano and your guitar. So I, I think, Dick, what you're talking about is absolutely correct, not having more than one guitar player or one piano player at a time. I think Jeff is talking about the guitar player and the piano player comping at the same time, and how do you help them make sure they stay out of each other's way when they're comping? Uh, okay. Yes. The, uh, the appropriate a way of comping between them is that the guitar player in the swing style now is what we're talking about plays the freddie green four quarter notes on the upper three strings and he plays on each down stroke with a pick chun 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 and you notice i'm emphasizing two and four the piano player at the same time can be playing what we call a um, an appropriate jazz style. So the piano player may be going, but so so they complement each other and they fit together. Now, when there's not the need for both of them playing, this is one of the reasons why they're seated close together, so they can identify back and forth who should be comping, and and that's a, a good way to handle that. Right. So if they're doing different things, they stay out of each other's way. But if one of them, if they're, you know, they can also say guitar takes this soloist, piano maybe comes right. behind the other soloist. Right. I also had, um, and, I, and I think that's that's an important point to talk about because uh, most of the ensembles that I hear that are inexperienced. The rhythm section plays all the time, everybody playing behind every soloist. And, and this is an opportunity to create different sounds behind the soloist. Maybe only the bass is playing behind the soloist, or maybe the bass and drums are playing behind the soloist, or maybe the piano and the drums are playing behind the soloist. I mean, there's all kinds of options that can, can create an interesting and uh, really jazzy sound and, that's, and those are things you'd have to change from the chart because a lot of people who are who are concert band teachers and they go to the jazz side of things they think that whatever is written is what you have to do right but right. of course doing things like that requires that we take stuff out add things and all that as long as it stays true to the music and follows the form of the tune that's a and terrific also, point and also that like you said where you reduce the number of players behind the solo that the soloist and whomever the rhythm section player or players are playing, that they have a conversation back and forth within the framework of the jazz solo. So important. And I think it's also important that the soloist play their soloist, play their instrument out in front of the rhythm section. Yep. Can I, can I share, I, I think too many piano players, uh, and it's for guitar as well, 
piano, guitar, also left hand drums. They too frequently play on beat one when they're comping. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so there's a drumline exercise that I learned many years ago that they called counter die because, of course, everything in drumline needs to be um, dramatic, right? But um, the exercise was one eighth note per measure and it went forward on eighth note every time. So the exercise went like this one, two, three, four, one, and three, four, one, two, three, four, one, and two, and four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, and one, two, three, four, one two, three, four, and, and it, it basically allows you. And if you do that with your kids, it it allows them to access all eight eighth notes and get mm -hmm. used to comping short and long notes on each one of those. So if anybody wants an exercise to do that one works and it's fun. That's a good idea. I like that a lot as well. Uh, at that same time, the hi hat and the ride symbol should be going mm -hmm. because, uh, in jazz, those are the two instruments that the drummer has that are the most important to the sound of the ensemble. They create a carpet of sound for the band. You know, while we're speaking about rhythm, I go back to the syncopation for modern drummer. You know, like, I guess I I teach my kids to count, right? In my school, we, we learn how to count all the rhythms and all this. But when we're hitting jazz band, I don't typically go... Okay, this rhythm, let's count it. And two, three, four, and. It's more like if they've if they've done that rhythm train method where they're doing five minutes a day or whatever on singing all these jazz rhythms, they just see it as ba da 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 da. Like it's just the sight reading mm -hmm. is so much better because they connect it to their oral, you know, model. Right. Right. So, so sometimes, you know, I also think a lot of concert band teachers, we want to make sure they can read everything. But again, if we go back to the oral part of this, if they look at the measure and they can't hear what that's supposed to sound like, it's okay to sing it with them. Maybe loop it a bunch of times so they get it so they get it in their ear. Um, I think that is not cheating. Too many people think that they have to read everything instead of playing things by ear. <laughs> and speaking of not cheating, you know, one of the things that the concert band and the marching band director can do very well is use Dr. Beat. Mm -hmm. And, you know... I think that's okay with the jazz band as well, because a lot of the young players just don't have that concept of the steady beat. Mm -hmm. And it's so important because that's where jazz began as a dance music. And so it has to be steady. And that helps to create the groove, which we were talking about earlier. And subdivision, like you're talking about above that, perfect. I actually just finished a jazz rehearsal two hours ago, and we were doing a great green cover chart by Alfred called Lester Leaps In uh, by Rich Sigler on the great, mm -hmm. the great Lester Young tune. And we did it at like a chord note equals 130, which is, of course, way under what that tempo is supposed to, what that tune is supposed to be at. We played the chart, and then I said, okay, let's go back and do it dance band style. So we did it more at 200 or something like that. But I put the high, my kids are old enough and good enough that I can put the hi hat on two and I can put the metronome on two and four. Mm -hmm. um, but it's funny they were right on it and then the, you know they slack down. But the metronome does does such great work. So you can do it on two and four, but you can also put it on um, one, two, three, four to help as well. I suggest if people do it, don't put it on four beats a measure. I would suggest tick 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 tick. So it's like just one sound all the time. That's my preference. Right, and and. On two and four really helps it swing. Mm -hmm. All right. So if people don't know much about piano voicings, um, they don't typically play the the block chord, right? The one, three, five, seven. I think it's important that students know what those are. But um, what is you know where do we start with people if they don't know what chords to play um, for comping? Well, actually, many of the written parts are not quite on target as mm -hmm. far as jazz is concerned. First of all, uh, interpreting the written parts requires a little bit of extra knowledge. And the first thing that I would say is the comping range is from middle C down to the C below and two octaves up to the C. And, and that's the range that makes the sound appropriate for the jazz ensemble because it's out of the basses range mm -hmm. and yet it's in a range where it will be heard and is appropriate. 
other mm-hmm. thing is when not to play. There, there is really not a reason for the piano to play when the full ensemble is playing, because uh, they're probably in the written part playing the same very notes that the ensemble is playing. So uh, I think that, that the idea of the, the piano uh, plays with frequent syncopation, uses a lot of space, that's a, that's a really good example. Okay, so the next thing I want to show you is an example of using just thirds and sevens. Mm-hmm. And this is a simple way of playing a 12-bar blues with just one hand. And this is where a lot of people start. I mean, a lot of people only start with one one note. But, but this is something that I think the beginning pianist can accomplish pretty quickly. And then the next example shows the full four hands Mm -hmm. and this would be an example that you would hope that the uh, player would be able to accomplish very soon in their uh, trial and again the rhythm is just as i uh, sort of sang before dot 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 do dot 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 and I absolutely never use the sustained pedal, except in a ballad. I would suggest if people, if this is new to people, um, to take a screenshot of this, if you're looking at it on YouTube, and take that and, and print it right out. Um, the first one you showed looked like it had just the upper portions, but on, but the second one is the one that has the thirds and the sevenths on it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Right. And both of these are from my uh, latest book, which is called uh, Jazz Zone, The Beginning. Mm. So uh, we, we not only deal with the piano, but we deal with every other instrument in the ensemble at a beginning level. That's great. What's it called again? In the Zone? Jazz Zone, oh. The Beginning. Jazz Zone, The Beginning. Mm-hmm. And it we'll can be uh, accessed from uh, the... Uh, uh, link called jazz zone online okay jazz zone online.com okay um what else about the piano should we tell people i think that's good for a starter and then of course the the real thing that is important is to be able to listen and so uh you know in in um In the ensemble book, uh, I give 10 examples for each instrument for people to listen to and listen to their style, listen to their uh, way of playing. And so that's that's just critical for them to understand how that instrument sounds uh, within the context of a regular uh, jazz uh, idea. So in this in this example, it's Count Basie. Duke Ellington, Chick Corea, Bill Evans, Kirby Hancock, Mary Lou Williams, Monty Alexander, Oscar Peterson, Thelonious Monk, and Toshiko Akiyoshi. Icons are important for each individual student to listen to so they understand the idiom. So years ago, when I, um, before Ellen Rowe went out to become her big self in the Midwest. She was uh, teaching in Connecticut at UConn. And she she came in and she said, for a quick hey dandy way to help your piano players, you know, always think of 7351 to get them going from what is written on the page. Mm-hmm. And uh, that really helped out a lot to a lot of my colleagues because, like you said, you get these big scores and they've got every note in the world in there and every part in the world in there. And you're saying, well, that is just too dense. It's filling up everything. And it's nobody's going to hear you anyway. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we used to uh, always show everybody the 7351 for the younger piano players that weren't studying too much and just learning how to play and everything. And uh, that that worked out real well, which is pretty close to what you have here. That's a great approach. Absolutely. And and people will notice with the guide tones in the left hand that when you change chords of the blues, you don't have to jump. You can just move in half steps. Mm-hmm. So it's it sounds smooth. I remember what I was going to say. It's the root of the word comp. Um, comping, referring to compliment. You were talking about listening and having piano players making sure they're listen, listening. Too many piano players, I think, just play what they think they want to play 
when their job is to complement either the soloist or the band. So finding those spaces where they can play and be the most effective is more important than just playing all the chords. Yeah, I agree with that totally. And and the other aspect about piano players coming into a jazz band is that this is probably the first experience that they've ever had with an ensemble. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of them are used to just playing by themselves. And, and the fact that they have to accept the fact that playing with others is really hip. And, and they just need to be able to figure out a way to fit into that. And so all of these things that we've talked about will help them to do that. I'd also like to reinforce something you said a few minutes ago, where you said middle C to low C, and the only two octaves above middle C stay in that range, in that pocket. And quite often when you listen to younger players, once you teach them what the basic structure is, they're getting their left, right hand way out there and the left hand way down. They say, no, come back in where you're nice and tight in that pocket and get them to comp in there. And I think for our younger directors, especially doing elementary jazz band and middle school jazz band, try to teach that. Try to get them to be as close as possible so they get used to that sound so they don't get carried away. Because, you know, they, they've been playing Chopin and they've been playing all these other Beethoven and they're going all over the keyboard. And that's not what we want. This is a different framework for them to understand. Right, Jeff. And I think the other thing along with that is a lot of the arrangers will double the left hand with the bass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's a no, no. <laughs> How often do we see, see that though? You know, we'll, we'll go, if we see a really great chart, all we're going to see in the piano part is chords. Mm -hmm. and, the piano players from there and then we'll see these parts that are written to help kids learn but the bass parts in there whereas if they just use the old rule seven three five one and put that in there for the people with just a simple comp they'd be teaching the kids so much more in their arranging of the of the pieces for younger directors because you got to figure that the the younger director is just also learning how this whole orchestration concept goes in deference to their concert band training that they had for four years in college. Right. right. There's also an intermediary you can do if you have a piano player who's learned just third and seventh, mm -hmm. and maybe they're not ready to add two other notes. I've actually found you can have kids simply just double the hands, whatever they're playing in the left hand. If it's third and mm -hmm. seventh, also play it in the right hand. Oh. It gives you a slightly bigger, thicker sound, but you're not kind of overwhelming the child. I found that as kind of like a half step, if you will, towards adding more notes. Great idea. Very stole, cool. Stole it from somebody. Um, can we start talking about drum set? We can. Because, you know, any of these instruments can make an ensemble or ruin an ensemble. I, I'll tell you what. If my band was playing and Buddy Rich was the drummer, we'd be killing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's so funny. If your drummer is great, there's so much that it's you're lucky. If your drummer is really not great, it's really hard to do anything, isn't it? It is. And I think, I think you know, let's start with the basics. This, this is the basic setup for a right-hand drummer, usually with only one tom. But uh, the idea is that it has to be set up in a appropriate manner. Now, the drum set role, number one is keeping time. Number two is playing in a style and playing dynamically. This is one of the, the problems that I see very often with rhythm sections is they just start out at the beginning and they go to the end and no dynamics are happening throughout. They must play with dynamics as the ensemble does. And then, as I said earlier, the cymbals create a carpet of sound. They also are responsible for making it feel good. So all of those things are important. And in addition to that, the ride and hi-hat function to balance those two. That's one of the very basic things that I do when I start with a band that has very little experience to make the volume and uh, the sound for each of those equal. And then interpreting drum set parts, boy, that's a, that's a deal. <laughs> I mean, here's a typical drum set chart. What does it tell you? Well, not very much, actually. So... 
the drum set player needs to be able to add this to the music. All of these things that are listed here with his pencil and to do it on every chart that they have so that he understands the style and the tempo, the roadmap, where the repeats are, identify the sections of the chart, the head, the solos, and so forth, who's playing the solos in each place, the form, where he has fills, and dynamics. If, if that is the actual way that he goes about or she goes about playing uh, and interpreting each drum set part, he'll be far in advance of not doing it. There are some things that, that struck me as you were talking about that that have hit me in my 20 plus years or so of teaching jazz band um, that came to mind. Um, one, people should think about their drummer when they program the music. Like if you have a new drummer, don't play a samba. You know, don't play an up-tempo tune if your kid can't play at that speed. So make sure what you play is in the pocket of your drummer or within, as like Jeff likes to talk about, the growth of where your drummer will be by that point. Um, when mentioning dynamics, you're absolutely correct. The drummer needs to play all the dynamics like all the rhythm section does. But I was taught by a great drummer named Brad Chahomsky, who's also a great composer. People should check him out. Um, he talks about how the drummer should also be like the weatherman of the drums of the rhythm section. How if there's a dynamic coming up, the drummer is the one to tell you that, like you add the crescendo in the drums before everybody else, or the drums get softer and that helps everybody else. Um, mm -hmm. so, so that's big. And then I also had somebody tell me, you were talking about cymbals. You were talking about balancing the hi-hat and the ride cymbal. I had um, a drummer I work with says, kids who start on drums, not in jazz band, it's all about the drums, like in rock music, it's snare and it's bass. So, so many kids start and the cymbals just aren't as strong as they need to be. Mm -hmm. And the drums themselves are too heavy. So it's important for directors to understand that, that in jazz band, really our cymbals are what are going to lead things. And of course the snare drum and bass drum have a roles, but it has to be cymbal heavy first. Mm -hmm. Those are my, remember, those are my drum thoughts. I remember years ago, back in the early seventies, I did, went to a lot of clinics with my band and uh, Justin Chocho from uh, New York and uh, the whole high school band director used to do something with their begin the beginning of the school year. They'd let their drummer have a hi-hat, a snare drum, mm -hmm. and a ride cymbal and a mm -hmm. real dry ride. And for the first two months of band, jazz band, that's all they could play on. Couldn't mm -hmm. have anything else. And then how many times have we all gone out to judge clinics and we'll look and we'll see the band setting up. And 15 minutes later, the drummer set up with six cymbals, uh, a double bass, <laughs> and the other thing. And you say, well, why don't you just have a, get rid of all that stuff, have a ride cymbal, have a hi-hat, have a smaller bass drum, small mounted tom, and maybe a floor tom in your snare and, play, and not have sticks that are six mm -hmm. inches wide so that you can see how hard you can play. And getting kids to understand that they've taken all these lessons on with uh, drum instructors on big drum sets, watching all these great j rock drummers with all these drums and saying, this is not rock. This is jazz and different feel. And I remember Justin DeChocho doing clinics with my kids and saying, listen, I can get just as much and more out of the band just by playing less. And he said, always remember less is more. That's great information. And also, Jeff, I'm sure that you remember Clem DeRosa. Oh, yeah. Clem was a time. As well. yep. Clem, Clem was one of the great jazz teachers. And he had a middle school band that sounded as good as any college band. And he was a drummer. And he utilized all of this information that we're talking about. I also, yeah. if, if anybody out there has a drummer who has drum solos, and frequently goes out of time and they struggle with those sections. I had many years ago, a mentor of mine came and worked with my band and simply pulled out the entire drum set, except for what you talked about. He, so he, the, the boy played the drum fill and it was awful. He played seven, eight and all the things. So then he pulls out everything attached to the, to the, the bass drum. And he said, and the symbol he said, okay, do it again. And the kid obviously played a great fill because they had less options. Mm -hmm. So he thought all about the time. And then what was funny is a couple minutes later, he went to give it back to him and the kid's like, no, 
I don't want the rest of the drum set. I've, <laughs> I've, I've learned my lesson. It's a, it's a great thing for drummers. And, and when that happens, you find out a lot of times kids who have these fabulous sets start realizing, I don't need all that. And they go looking around for a small bass drum with, with one timbre and then a small tom with a different timbre and a snare. And they don't go to buy a full set, but they buy drums based on the color that they're getting from the instrument. And then they go for listening to all these symbols and they'll start trying around and say, well, this is a drier ride. I can get the point across much more poignantly by having this dry ride. And then they, they start listening to what they're playing and choosing their equipment based on the sound rather than what it looks like. Mm -hmm. awesome. Great. Um, can we get into the bass a little bit? You bet. Yeah. So we've, again, we've had lots of episodes on, on a lot of this stuff already. So I, if people are digging this and want to hear more, of course, we did not have the prestigious Dick Dunscombe with us, but we talked about, a lot about things like um, how to create walking lines and really simple ones and, base, and basic ones like that. Go back and check out some of our other episodes about that. Well, let me start <laughs> by talking about the bass. And, and of course, their role in jazz is to create a walking bass line. And they also are the pitch center and harmonic foundation for the full ensemble. So if the bass is out of tune, the band is out of tune. Mm -hmm. And once again, listen to the masters in that genre. And some of those that I would mention at this part are Ron Carter, mm -hmm. Ray Brown, John Clinton, or John Clayton, Eddie Gomez, and Milt Hinton. Those are really great players. And and Talking about the phrasing of the quarter notes when they're playing a walking bass line, uh, it's, it's very important that they have the knowledge of the way to strike the instrument, the string. When they're playing in a slow or moderate tempo, their finger should be pointing down to the floor. Mm -hmm so that they connect, can connect the notes one to the next. When it's an up-tempo, then their finger is parallel to the floor because then there's little space in between each one of, of those. So uh, I also go back to the same thing we were talking about earlier with the metronome on two and four. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the demonstration of the medium and up-tempo lines is really important. And then once again, here's a, a simple way of creating that bass line. Now, in, in most charts that are grade one, two, and three, the bass line is written. But when you get into the upper grades, the more advanced charts, they aren't. So they have to understand and know how to create a walking bass line. Now, this one is just using chord tones. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. That works fine. But as they get a little more advanced, this is a line over that same set of changes that would be a little bit more appropriate. Mm -hmm. So there's a, lot, uh, there's a lot to talk about with the bass. I've, I've found that when we get, when I, so I have a kid who, who wants to start the bass. First of all, I choose a kid who's a good musician and reliable because the bass player along with the drummer are the only ones who play the entire stinking chart, right? So you're, you need to choose a good musician for your bass player. Um, number two, uh, I talk about, um, I actually have my kids read changes right away along with reading um, the bass lines and I have them work on just playing roots so they're comfortable with where the roots are and then i actually have them play the thirds um especially in e flat and b flat and f because it's the open string right right below it um so i have my kids start to start to use roots and thirds and then the fifth below which is the sort of the next note that i have them use to create their own bass lines in addition to learning mm -hmm. these bass lines as well it's a great way to start so, but pick the right kid. I'm telling you, take, getting a bass player, it's all about picking the right kid. Somebody, Somebody that's steady. Yep. Sometimes you can't pick the right kid, but you, if, you have, if you have an orchestra program and you go through and you find a, a bass player that can keep good time, you train them to become a good, your good jazz bass player. But 
I find the one thing, and I, I always had trouble with this, is that the bass player, just on an upright, can't be heard, so they have to be amplified. And that's always been my nemesis of getting an upright bass player that I've transitioned over to get a good bass sound that I can amplify so that you have an upright bass player rather than an electric bass player playing. Mm -hmm. Do you have well, any suggestions on how to yeah. fix that? Yes, uh, there are several different pickups available that hook onto the bass. The Barkus Berry is the one that most ba bass players use today. And it's appropriate uh, that they have that and that they can control the, the volume sound. But you bring up another point, and that's the electric bass, because many people don't have an acoustic bass. Mm -hmm. It's been my experience that you can create almost an appropriate sound by adjusting the bass uh, on its amplifier and on its instrument itself and playing with the right hand close to the end of the fingerboard and the correct use of amplements, uh, amps and uh, to create the sound that has a little bit more bass and not so much treble in it. And you can adjust that to make it sound pretty good. I will say we did an episode, I believe it was episode number 72 or so with Larry Williams and Larry is a professional bass player. And we did talk Larry and I about a lot of these specific things you can do to your bass sound um, mm -hmm. into the amps to get it to be really high quality. So if people are enjoying this and want more, go check that one out too. Let me mention one more thing about the bass before we leave this. And um, I have done this series called jazz zone together. And I have now 62 interviews with professional jazz players, educators, and uh, people associated with the jazz instruments. And one of the most important of those was with Rufus Reed. Mm -hmm. And we know Rufus is one of the fantastic jazz players of all time. And he talks a little bit in that interview about the idea of adjusting toward the uh, electric bass. Although he firmly believes that every bass player should at least be beginning to play the acoustic. Mm -hmm. So that's called the Jazz Zone? Jazz Zone Together. Jazz Zone Together. It's, a, it's on a YouTube channel, and it can also be accessed at printmusicsource.com. Great printmusicsource.com and there's 62 interviews everything from Arturo Sandoval to uh, boy you name it we got them <laughs> hmm, that's awesome that's with Rufus Reed is one of the people that is going to be on that yes correct F fabulous educator I, I did a clinic I was in a clinic with my band in, in Connecticut and he he lives outside of New York City, near where we were, and mm -hmm. came in, he did a clinic, and in about five minutes, he fixed so many problems, just saying, do this, 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 and he said, now play. And uh, genius, he just sits there and listens, and then doesn't say where walks up to your kids and just say, do these five things, and mm -hmm. then has them play, and, and wonderful, wonderful yeah. educator. He's amazing. Last thing I'll say about the bass is um, if people are new or have new bass players and they are not as comfortable, two common things if you're in the swing style, especially slow swing, make sure your your notes are long and connected and that we're accenting beats two and four. Mm -hmm. There we go. All right, let's go to the guitar because the guitar is the same rhythm as the bass if you're in the Freddie Green style, but um, it should be a short sound versus the long sound of the bass. Yeah, it's a comping instrument, and as you say, you know, it's related to the bass and the piano. So it provides rhythmic and harmonic accompaniment. Its chord voicings are, generally speaking, on the upper three strings. Again, thirds, fifths, sevenths, and single note lines occasionally, and the fact that it must balance with the piano. But the style for comping, if you want to really learn about it, go to freddiegreen.com. Hmm. Freddie Green was Basie's incredible guitar player. And uh, you can't, can't find any more information than, than that about 
somebody who really, really knows about the guitar instrument. But I will also tell you that there are other people that I would recommend listening to. Uh, in addition to Freddie Green, Jim Hall, Russell Malone, Pat Martini, John Pizzarelli, and many others. But mm -hmm. I think it's important that we do have this information available to the students so that they can, can listen to the pros. And, and then I'll tell you also, this is a typical guitar part. So we have to be able to be aware of how your uh, student learns how to comp with the chord changes. And I think, Kyle, you've been talking about this. Why don't you sure. give us an example um, there? So, so I, I will say that, you know, I've recently... You know, if people go onto YouTube and just search, you can find some great videos about how to start kids on playing thirds and sevenths, especially, you know, they call them shell voicings, three, seven, nine, mm -hmm. things like that. And uh, it's really amazing because um, you can do it on the upper strings, which is where you want to be, but you can start them on the lower strings, which is an easy way to do it, and then move them to upper strings. Um, there's so many things that you can do, like, I learned, okay, does it matter if it says minor seven or minor seven flat five? Well, if you're not playing the fifth, it doesn't matter. So mm -hmm. I have kids who can play almost every tune just by knowing three basic shapes, major mm -hmm. seven, dominant seven, minor seven. And again, if you have the right kid who is motivated and can do that, they can read changes like this, no problem. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say YouTube is an amazing resource because like most band directors, I'm not a guitar player and I'm able to learn a lot through there. So please check out a lot of things on there. I'm not, I don't sponsor any of them, but there, there's amazing literature there. There really is. And, and the other thing that I will say, and I only say this because I've seen it before, the guitar player needs to use a pick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in many instances I go in and, and that's not happening. And so just that change makes it more appropriate for the style. Mm -hmm. it's great like i'm i have a, a super fabulous young musician right now who's a freshman and she's just started on guitar and i have her on the lower strings playing the the first string and then the third and fourth string because and not playing the second string because mm -hmm. you can you can it, it's an easier way to get started on this um is what i've learned um and i'm now in the transition of a process of transitioning her to those upper strings but you can't use a pick on the lower ones because we haven't well, she's not at a place where she's learned the muting yet. Because if, right. if you're using strings that are open, you're going to get obviously sounds that you don't want. So again, pick a smart kid <laughs> on, on the guitar. And I will tell you, if you, to me, if you really want your band to swing like the Basie band, the guitar is an essential instrument. So many bands have bass, drums, and piano, and they don't quite sound like the Basie band, no matter how good they are. To me, that guitar is just the essential sound. Well, don't you think the the guitar they play has a definitive effect? Of course. You got a kid coming in with a hard rock guitar and they're just banging away at it. Oh and then you got somebody coming in with a hollow body. It just makes a huge difference. Indeed it does. And yet, by the same token, it's, it's, a pro, it's possible to adjust that Stratocaster or whatever <laughs> instrument they have mm -hmm. to sound almost like yeah. a music guitar. <laughs> <laughs> almost <Yeah. laughs> but it's it's again the adjustment within the uh amplifier itself and the guitar less trouble more mids yeah mm -hmm. a warmer sound and and a little bit of a uh, reverb and if you're doing freddie green ask your ch your student to turn down a little bit and play harder through the strings and that down, or them. Off. <laughs> down or off that's right that's right <laughs> Awesome. So I think we've thoroughly covered a lot of rhythm section stuff. We've talked a lot about articulation. Dick, I'm going to ask, you know, with all of your wealth of experience, we could go on for 10 hours and not have a shortage of things to say. Could we um, wrap it up by just maybe a message that you might have to band directors these days um, who are either new to jazz or experienced in jazz? Some, just some, you know, a message you, you might leave them with. Sure. Well, let me first of all say thank you to you and Jeff for this opportunity to share information. It's been so much fun. And 
I guess I'd say the same things I said at the beginning. You have to be able to learn the idiom. So the way to learn it is by listening to it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't listen to it, it's not going to happen. Second thing is the articulation. And we've talked a great deal about that. The third thing <clears throat> would be the uh, appropriate rhythm section. And one thing that we weren't able to get to tonight was the improvisation. Mm -hmm. But that's also critical. And I will, uh, I will send you a couple of handouts that I have that you can share with your people uh, as, as appropriate. And, that, that would be great. I'll, I'll post them on growingband.com as soon as you good. send them to me. And, and let me also mention just the, the two uh, items that I have available today. And that is the beginning jazz method, which is called Jazz Zone Together. <laughs> and that uh, is accessible through jazzzoneonline.com. Mm -hmm. And the other is this great interview session that I've been doing. And I have, as I said, 62 interviews from everybody uh, that you can think of in the jazz uh, field today. And that's uh, accessible through printmusicsource.com. And on YouTube, right? And also there is a YouTube channel. Exactly. It's awesome. Last thing I will say, suggest to people, um, have someone come listen to your band. Because getting another set of ears on your band, uh, other band directors, other musicians, have them come and listen. And, uh, you know, a lot of band directors are afraid to have people come listen to their group. I would say open it up to whatever and let everybody come and listen and give them clinics, not just at performances, but at any time. Mm -hmm. So, Dick Dunscombe, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for, for being with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I've really enjoyed this. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to the Growing Band Director. See you next week.